Welcome to Swimming with Alligators. I'm Ernest Sweat, and each episode, Alexa Benz and I give you a VC podcast from the LP perspective. You ready? Let's dive in. Welcome to a special episode of Swimming with Alligators. We call these our DDQ episode, a little play on the due diligence questionnaire. Uh, but for Ernest and I, we end up de discuss, de debate, and Q questioning, answering some questions from the audience. So, with that, uh, we'd love to dive in. We're doing these about every 10 episodes. And so first, we're going to discuss some of the things that we are hearing from LPs that don't make it into the final podcasts, either per their requests or um, because they were offline. So um, here's some of the things that we are hearing in a more um, honest and frank personal one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so we'll start off with discuss, um, you know, I wanted to start off first with um, an article from Theory Ventures uh, was written uh, talking about the Series A crunch has returned. Mm -hmm. um, and Tomas uh, speaks about how in 2012, there was a ton of seed companies uh, and then, or Series A companies, and then that caused the Series B stage to be extremely hard. And so we're seeing that again. And from our conversations with a lot of LPs and other VCs uh, around, you're starting to notice and hear how the seed stage and pre-seed stage, there's so much capital there and still so much uh, variance in the pricing um, that's causing a lot of trouble in the next round series a and so um a friend i just saw uh today uh robbie um a infrastructure uh vc uh and friend of the pod she was uh posting that one million in ar is not a mark for series a yeah and i think that used to be the gold standard but now i think the industry as a whole is so honest in the fact that, hey, a Series A to one person may not be a Series A to another person when it comes to metrics. And this is um, an elevated problem. Back to you, everyone should check out the, the article, the Series A Crunch by Theory Ventures. But right now, I believe there's like a some crazy amount of seeds to Series A's, like 10 or so, I believe, 10 to 1. Um, so that's the first thing. I, I don't know if you have any opinions on that, Alexa, it, but like, that's just, this, that's just a problem right now. The, uh, the series B crunch, the joke used to be for, for gals who are founder hunters in San Francisco, go try to find somebody who's just failed to raise. <laughs> Cause it's an ambitious person who's had their like knees cut out from under them. <laughs> And they're going to make a much better life partner than the person who didn't survive the Series B crunch. I uh, I think the one thing I've also heard is that, you know, you expect to have like three seed rounds. And so partially this all just feels like bizarre semantics, where by the time you're ready for Series A, you've had three official fundraisers. <laughs> um, but, but I guess we're all having to come to agreement that... Um, we call the hardest one at the, we call the hardest one, the series A. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's, uh, everybody can agree today. It is the hardest one. And I, I misquote is five to five seeds to okay. every series A, but yeah. still that's a ton. Yeah, um, sure. and so, yeah, that, I think that's, we'll I'll talk about this in the next segment, but I think with that trouble, it's also an opportunity in that stage as well. No, I, I think one of the metrics everybody likes to track in VC is, you know, are you, what, what is your graduation rate? If you're a seed investor, how many are you graduating mm. in Series A? And um, so that's going to continue to be a super powerful stat to track for your own KPI. Um, another thing I would love to discuss is this crazy statistic that General Catalyst and Andreessen captured 44% of the USVC fundraising so far in 2024. 
That's 44% of all LP capital so far committed in 2024. So uh, we are seeing mega funds resurging. And I would love to discuss what that means for VCs and then maybe also what that means for LPs. Yeah, it means for, for VCs that depending on if you're an established manager or at a mega fund or an emerging manager, you're going to have different experiences or different outcomes. It might be, um, I think overall it's just tougher for everyone, but you're starting to see, um, it kind of goes back to that old adage in business. Like, uh, you can't get fired for hiring IBM. I yeah. think blue chips and established fund managers, um, they just feel safer right now. And so we can debate and discuss if that is like the right uh, approach for LPs, but it clearly with this stat is showing that um, that is what ha that's what's happening. Now, the other yeah. thing you th can think about though, is like, it is kind of like a denominator and um, a, a fact of, and, and just numbers of kind of weighted averages, right? If you're raising more, you're going to have more of it. It's going to be more of your funds, but you know, would be I would be curious to understand like, were those the original targets or not? Yeah. Was that number going to be bigger? So yeah, for Andreessen, the number I think they published was about half, uh, and so they actually raised double. <laughs> the yeah, I think if you're a pre seed or seed investor, I'm I'm like. Courting my buddies at those top tier funds because they're going to be making or breaking your outcomes. <laughs> like if you can get them following on, uh, keep them keep them close. Those are your best friends. Because <laughs> I don't see founders turning down these brand name name. I mean, there's going to be one one in a million that's like, oh, I prefer this this other series I lead. Um, because they're willing to pay me less, but they have more relevant experience and they'll give me more time. I think for the LPs, it's fascinating really because the game has generally been like, stay out of VC unless you can participate in the top funds, but they were so exclusive you couldn't get in. So 2023, 2024 is kind of crazy time to be an LP because you know, anecdotally, I was chatting with a, a SoCal kind of RIA multifamily office and they haven't had a uh, venture strategy in the past, but they were able to go get allocation in Andreessen among a few others. And they said, okay, we'll go ahead and sprinkle that into our strategy because now we can get access. <laughs> and and similarly allocate, uh, for those of you who don't know, they have a platform. You can build a portfolio with pretty reasonable minimums. And and I know Andreessen was one of the 20 some funds that, that you could get into. So it's, this, this whole universe of exclusivity is kind of like, seems like is kind of out the door. Um, so on the one hand, it's incredible that you're able to get access. But I also wonder, was your intention to get access to a mega fund? Because now you're playing that the kind of like back of the envelope math is really hard. Mm. So do you continue to believe the top tier firms are the only option and that they're going to be able to three X $7 billion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think <laughs> that's, that's a tall task and a hard yeah. task. I think some, a very small percentage may be able to, but yeah. I think the question is really asking LPs and, you know, new allocators, kind of what's the purpose of, you know, what are you trying to get out of your venture portfolio? Um, is it really sizable returns? Is it just some exposure? Um, that's, I think that's the kind of question that they should be asking themselves and then making the appropriate decision based on that. One, one last super interesting thing from Pitch Book that I think would be, I, I don't quite understand it. So I think it'd be cool to chat through it. It seems different this time 
the concentration in megaphones. They have this graph mm -hmm. that shows the share of LP capital that's concentrated in the five largest US, US VC funds from like 2020 to today. Mm -hmm. And every other year, it never went above 20%. But we seem to be on track to have the top five being far more than that. I mean, we already have, we're halfway mm -hmm. through 2024 and 44% is between two funds. <laughs> so in the initial era of like the Kotus and SoftBanks, things were less concentrated than they look like they're on track to be for 2024. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating. I think we're taking the power law to uh, new heights and new areas when it comes to like, concentration of allocation. Um, but it's something that yeah, we definitely should keep our eyes out on. And despite you know numbers like that, every day I'm hearing about new spinouts yeah. of of friends doing um, you know teaming up with people or um, being a solo capitalist or a solo GP themselves. And so um, a lot of things are gonna stay the same yet change at the same time. Yeah, the resurgence of the mega funds. They're back people. They are, <laughs> um, and, but, but I think that that doesn't mean there won't be uh, you know, more cottage industry funds. And it brings me on uh, the next thing I wanted to discuss um, was I saw an interesting uh, post on X the other week, uh, and it was the 33 questions that led to partnership. And it was this expansive number of mm -hmm. questions, 33 from uh, Pace Capital. And um, what those two gentlemen asked each other, you know, before starting the um, partnership. And so- uh -huh from stuff like work style to, you know, what do you think the team should look like economics? What should time be, you know, mm -hmm. to, um, time priorities on different activities? What are your weaknesses, strengths, um, motivations? And I thought it was so intentional. And I think it's the intentionality that's really demanded from this job. Uh, if you're, going to be a successful fund manager. Yeah. And so I was curious what questions, you know, what, what kind of, you know, caught your eye Alexa, but, or, or what questions would you want to ask someone no. or feel like people should ask their potential partners? Yeah, no, this, this kind of reminds me of like, if you are interested in working in tech, consider your job uh, selecting where you go to work like a venture capitalist. And similarly, it's like, okay, if you're sitting down interviewing your potential partner, you should be thinking about it like an LP. Like, what am I going to mm. see when I see you two? Um, and, and I think a hundred percent, it's gotta be, it's gotta be, are we, are we capable of top decile returns? What is it about us? Cause I think it's a job that a lot of people want to do. It's it's like getting to work in Hollywood. Like you're willing to start at the bottom of the mailroom because it's an exciting, cool gig. Yeah. But do you actually think you're going to be one of the exceptional ones and why? <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that's what you should be looking for in your partner is something where you're like, that mother effer is the smartest freaking person or has access to something nobody else in this world has. That's what I would be looking for in, in a GP partner. Yeah. Yeah. I, it reminds me of, um, you know, one of my first Kaufman sessions. Um, and I'm not sure I can share this, but like one of my, what the speaker who won't be named, but um, she said when she was asked what was the best investment she ever made, it was like she said in deciding to work with who she ended up partnering oh, with. Awesome. Oh, that's fun. And she was like, this is the best investment I've ever made. And I think that has to be the case for things that are partnerships are special because every LP we talk about is like when you have a partnership, 
they're looking at each of your individual track records mm -hmm. and then in diligencing each of you, but then they're also di diligencing your partnership. And that's going to be the most fragile thing. Yeah. And so um, just like when we talk to founders and you can tell people kind of like founder dated, but never went through kind of like the counseling needed before they got married. And so, um, yeah, I would, I would push everybody to look at these. There's some great questions on here. Um, in thinking about how you all work together. And it's really challenged me to think about, you know, what are things, those motivations for me? What are my superpowers? How important is brand? Um, what are the key values that I wanna have in any firm and wanna be able to resent, represent day one, day 365, day 10,000. So everybody should read this. Next D is a uh, debate. And so this is where we don't provide any real kind of prep for the other uh, co host and uh, bring up a subject and uh, have a lively debate on it. So um, I kind of hinted at, I'll start, I kind of hinted at this at with the kind of series A crunch and all the doom and gloom of uh, 1 million AR isn't enough. What is a series A and all the bad things associated with that. But I believe that the biggest opportunity right now in the entire e ecosystem is a new series A fund or a new series A funds. Um, yeah, go where the crunch is. I say, yeah, go where the crunch is. And I say that because if you look at the entire industry, we have uh, a ton of great pre-seed and seed investors, solo capitalists, um, and um, uh, individuals who are really kind of driving the cottage industry at the early, early, earliest stages. And then we have um, multi-stage funds that can do cradle to grave for you. But when kind of the rubber meets the road and you're trying to get that graduation from C to series A, there aren't that many funds, or I shouldn't say, there needs to be more funds that are focused just on A and A prime yeah, because it's such a critical um, stage. And so I believe there's a lot of opportunity there. How big a fund does that need to be in order to have lead checks and and yeah. enough? I think so enough companies I would say portfolio. maybe- Minimum 150? Yeah, yeah. So I would say more than that. I would say probably 175 minimum, mm -hmm. 200, 200 million. Um, just given that there's a fluctuation in what a Series A can be. Because we got at the height of 21, they were getting to 25, 30 million kind of rounds that we saw in series B historically. And so depending on what you're investing in, um, whether it's a AI company, gen AI company, or something around enterprise artificial intelligence, that's going to be the high end. And then everything else with, <laughs> with growth, you can see rounds of 8 million, 9 million, 10 million again. And so I think being around somewhere between that 200 to three hundred million uh, dollar fund size would be ideal. It's it's hard for me to debate this without kind of tapping a little bit into what I wanted to bring up next. Okay, but I think they all play into each other because okay. one thing I would say is maybe you want to be looking at some companies where the fair market value has been reset, and you're not coming off of these blown up seed valuations. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're just picking where in the in the life cycle you're investing, the the crunch sounds good. Crunch sounds like it needs some money. <laughs> it does. That you're gonna have some options. Um, but those founders are all I don't know. Have they been have they been like have they been knocked down in the way that, that you might be hoping to founder date back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you want the people who have really just like lost their unicorn status like maybe maybe those are maybe that's the portfolio i want right now maybe i, I that feels like more of a the crunches that series b series c and other growth yeah you call that like an ipo crunch yeah ipo crunch but um I don't know about this early stage. People feel like already having a unicorn status and and being cut down. That's a that's a that's a hell of a, a <laughs> turnaround story. Um, which I was talking to somebody uh, about this. I don't know if you've ever had this. I don't think I've had one company where I've invested in uh, my ten years in a down round where that actually turned around. Oof, this is a this is a tough reality, right? Yeah. Once the growth slows, I mean, that's, I think that's why everybody's struggling with right now with like, do we just need to land the plane or is there still a chance that this thing has escape velocity because everybody's turned off growth? Yeah. It's like you just aren't used to seeing anybody recover from that. Yeah. But yeah. I guess we're going to have to have a few, there'll be a few survivors. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think there'll be survivors, but I think they've always, you can have companies that have kind of teetered, 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 slow growth, right. slow growth, then kind of like taken off. But to just like do a 180 and then back, I, I don't know. It's, it's just such a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I think you. I won. I think I won that uh, that first one. So. <laughs> All right. Next next question of show debate. I want to play a new, a, an updated version of Start Bench Cut. If you heard our last DDQ, we pitted some sort of stereotypical, theoretical emerging managers against each other in the game of who would you start, who would you bench, and who would you cut. Um, but I don't think this gives the full picture of what is available to the family office, high net worth, individual LP set these days. If you're a little myopic if you're thinking of your competition as just other managers who are fundraising right now because there's so many cool new products out there where we can get access to venture as an asset class and um, let alone things other than venture. There's plenty to invest in. So um, I want to do a start bench cut of three kind of products that would be considered a competitor to uh, putting together your own suite of managers. So, if you say if you say private credit, I'm cutting that shit. <laughs> no, it's all venture, all venture. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> okay, my my first my first athlete is a let's call it like a secondary fund, some kind of index like okay. solution similar to what our sponsor and friend Dave Thornton at Vested offers, where okay. you've got a basket of all late stage mature companies. They're pre IPO, they're venture backed, and they've been repriced. So it's all 2024 fair market value, low fees. And you don't have to be so patient. So like what, five years? So that's player number one, secondary okay. fund. Uh, player number two would be like a the portfolio blue chip brand name venture that this like, say your RIA can now put together for you or you can get through Allocate where you get access to the light speeds and the Coslas all with reasonable minimums. So it's all top tier franchise funds. Um, and then player number three Plenty of people are saying, let's just be direct. We'll go direct ourselves. Y you talk to these family offices who they can find an ex-associate or analyst from one of these top tier funds. They bring them in house. And so they got people, they've got time. They're going to make some concentrated bets. Just stick to the industries they know. And you pick your own startups. You don't need GPs. Huh. I love I love how you asked me to do this because it, it <laughs> Hey, you, next time I'm coming up with the, the start bench and cut so I can put you, be like, hey, which of our sponsors do you think will work? Uh, Alexa. Uh, <laughs> I was like, Alexa, it's, it's good. <laughs> next season is going to be Alexa and, and somebody else. Um, all right. So we have the secondaries. We have the new creative ways to get access to um, blue chip funds. Yeah. And then we have direct through family offices. So I would say I would um, hmm, start the probably secondaries mm. um, because if I'm a family office, I'm thinking about like, when am I actually going to get some DPI? 
Mm-hmm. And maybe in this fake scenario in 2020 and 2021, I put a lot of money in different funds and I just haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Um, to so bench, I would do something like allocate where I get access and kind of index, uh, create own, my own little index fund of uh, tier one funds. Um, and multi-stage funds. Um, and then I would cut the uh, direct investing. And I'm making the assumption that um, they are um, new to investing mm-hmm. in in early stage. And kind of in the scenario you mentioned, it's like somebody more junior who might have some access, but like that's a really, really, really big bet. Um, and they might not have that much access to put in legitimate check sizes. So totally. that's no, what I would do. I, th- I think it's an interesting pattern we're seeing that some people are saying, we'd rather not have managers. We're going to try to do this ourselves. And, and for sure, a big pitch, I think, for our early GPs is, you know, we're going to give you co-investment opportunities. So the number of LPs who think that that is the start, (laughs) you know, it's, it's an interesting challenge for anybody who's fundraising to say, you, you do need my help. You do need my access. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the, uh, what we hear often is everybody asks for co-investments and then when it comes around, you know, they don't have time to move quick, quick enough to do it or what have you. Well, interesting as a, uh, I think it's just helpful to sort of like, so zoom out a little bit and be like, okay, your only option is not right now to just pick uh, which manager that we're, there's a lot of new products coming out. It's, it's a great time to have a, a podcast for allocators to think about all the options too. <laughs> um, so for debate number three, um, something that's been coming up a lot with all of our conversations, recent interviews that we've released and some we haven't released yet. Um, has been the emergence of the solo GP. And I've actually been very surprised despite the numbers that we've heard from like fundraising and capital going to a lot more of the established brands, Mm -hmm. more and more very talented millennial um, investors are spinning out and creating their own funds. And a lot of them as a solo GP. And many of them don't want to be a solo GP forever, mm-hmm. uh, but didn't want to rush their um, rush any type of partnerships. And so yeah. I'm really intrigued with like, what's going to happen to them? So my, uh, uh, I guess, stance mm-hmm. is I think we're going to see a lot of mergers yeah. over the next um five years of these people building out their um, their brands, continuing their track mm-hmm. records and merging and finding those different partners and either kind of keeping one of the names or starting anew with some fun ones. I, I, I do think there I, there's at least one pretty good example. I started out my VC career at Maven Ventures where uh, the solo GP gym over time gave more and more responsibility to his first junior hire, Sarah, who has now taken over as the main GP on this latest fund. Kudos to Jim that he like figured out what that looked like. Um, and now Sarah's in the, in the leader, yeah. like the, the main thought. Yeah. Yeah. I um, So the way I see it is that because there's going to be more of these solo GPs, some of them might raise enough funds to lead some seed and and maybe even some Series A rounds. But as they get to more of that Series A and Mango yeah. seed, um, they're going to have to have more party rounds. Yeah. So I think it'll give people exposure to uh, working with others, being on the boards with others, um, and so something might flourish through those experiences. Well, okay, last topic to debate. Is 2024 going to be a breakout vintage? 
So we've got some helpful stats on how okay. important the vintage year turns out to be in this game we're playing called Venture. Okay. Stepzone published some numbers. Over the course of 23 vintage years, 80% of the returns came from five, six separate vintage years. So hitting the vintage year right is uh, not a rec- – we wouldn't recommend trying to time the market, but it turns out to matter uh, that you do happen to hit the right years. So what's your take on 2024? Is this going to be one of the stars? I think it's definitely going to be better than um, 2020 and 2021. Um, but I think some time will, will tell on, I think you still need to be disciplined. Uh, you obviously, if you're going to be investing in some hype uh, industries, you need to pick the right winners uh, in those industries. And um, ownership, it always comes down to ownership as well, right? You can pick the right winners in Logo Shop, but you won't really end up with any kind of strong returns. So I think 2024 is going to be there, but I think it actually makes me want to think of like, so when did you start? I started my career, venture career in 2016. So yeah, 90, which of those years, 80, 2016 to now, which, which, uh, which is, how would you rate the years? I think that, that kind of is like, okay, of the years I've been in now, would I rank 2024? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if so little capital continues to be committed in 2024, it's going to mean anybody who does raise is going to have a lot of opportunity and choice. I think yeah. that drives down valuations. So I think yeah. that helps out ownership. It just gives everybody, allows everybody to be pickier. Should you be raising in 2024? I think this should give you like a little beat to a drum to beat that this is, this is worth doing right now. And if you're an LP who's investing right now, I think things are going to look pretty good uh, in retrospect, looking back at 2024. Should you want to rep the 2024 vintage? We now <laughs> offer a t-shirt, limited edition that says, in fact, 2024 vintage on uh, swimmingwithallocators.com backslash shop. And um, I am. I'm gonna. Su- I'm gonna go ahead and say this is gonna be a breakout year. This is worth doing. Yeah, I should. You should have. I didn't see where you were going until it was too late. Yeah, 2024 is gonna be the best vintage, <laughs> and you should buy a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Our final segment questions. We have a few questions that we've received from an audience. Thank you so much. If you have any more questions, just send them over um, and we'll run down these quickly. Um, One first time fund manager said, what can I possibly include in an LP update that actually gets them over the line? Like we all have these drip campaigns. What should they say? Well, I think from hearing and from a lot of LPs, they want to hear consistency. they want to hear that there's a conviction in your strategy and you're executing on it. Um, I was talking to a emerging manager today and he was telling me about his, you know, pipeline and, and kind of co-collaborating over a year with LPs Mm -hmm. and keeping in touch with them. And uh, a number of them, you know, initial feedback was you were too broad and you were saying, trying to be Mm -hmm. all things to everybody. And they didn't know where to put you and how you fit. And so that makes them want to, if you get that initial, not now, but maybe later, they want to see what you put pen to paper is actually what you end up doing. So uh, I think being able to clearly say that and clearly, um, you know, execute on what you said you were going to do is really important. And then the second piece I would say is, Um, When I think about some of the best LP updates, they're genuinely that person. So Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of one emerging manager and uh, he's just a great writer. You you can tell that like, it's not trying to be too formal or too casual, but he's just himself. 
and you can feel that he put time into it. And so being, you know, really kind of drafting something that's truly you is important too. Yeah. So that's a great point. Like is the point when you're messaging them really expecting that they are going to come in on this final close or is this a a longer sell in which you expect to maybe work together in two, three, four years? Um, Yeah. I really like that point that you just like, it doesn't have to be like everything is news. Everything is breaking news. It's much more uh, just like consistently executing on your strategy. I do think the one thing that actually gets people to make a decision if they are still considering coming in is a deadline. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise I, I th- can meet with any other emerging manager and still sit on my decision about you. <laughs> oh, I thought you, I thought you were going to say is uh, it's uh, we, we're oversubscribed. You have to wait till the next month. I mean, month. that one works too. That one works. There you go. We got two. What are two things you included in your LP update? I'm oversubscribed or yeah. Um, okay. Second question from the audience. This is an aspiring ally. What is something I can do to be a better ally? And he's speaking um, specifically about uh, for minorities and women in finance. Well, I think this was going around a lot in 2020 and 2021, but instead of more mentorship, uh, writing a check. And so I know a number of um, executive coaches, former GPs of other firms, um, just starting a small LP book. And so they were write small checks within um, emerging managers that were from underrepresented uh, backgrounds just to show that support. So yes, it's great to, it's kind of the old adage of what it, you get when you ask for advice, you get money. And when you ask for money, you get advice. Or um, if yeah. you're black or female, you just always just get advice. Is that how the adage goes? <laughs> it doesn't matter what you ask for. You just get advice. <laughs> when you're black or a woman, you you just get advice. Yeah, maybe that's it. Is that our, is that our next? And we have a t-shirt for that now. Uh, (laughs) I'm here asking, yeah, I'm here for advice. Um, I, I also feel like, um, another one for me is the next time you have a freaking rad opportunity, make the first person you send it to somebody from one of these less include included groups. So it's like you, you have there's four partners at the yeah. series a fund, send it to the black partner, send yeah. it to the female partner. Yeah. Um, if you are day trading and you have a hot stock tip, send it to your niece, send it to your sister. Um, because I think, uh, there's these communities where people just share the best stuff and the way for us to be top decile investors is to be included in these share circles. So um, that's what I would suggest is like next time you have something rad to share, share it first with somebody you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Another uh, point of advice I just heard today um, from an emerging manager uh, that allies can and participate in is if you're not able to write a check, is be an advocate and essentially a disciple hmm. on behalf of that emerging manager. Mm-hmm. And the idea that this 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 person shared with me is they had kind of this advisory council where they had friends who were other emerging managers, executives, founders review their deck, not just to review yeah. and give feedback, but he wanted them to know his story as good and narrative as good as him. Hmm. So then they could spread the gospel. Uh, because that then helps, you know, LPs are, are like venture venture capitalists who you get a lead from and who validates kind of like your thinking on if someone's good or not really impacts your decision if it's a go or no go. And so that's another thing. Be a Paul Revere for one of these people you want to be an ally for. Um, and last question, someone considering raising their own fund, what Swimming with Allocators episode would you recommend? That's really hard. What I've learned from the audience is they're vastly different opinions on what is the perfect episode for what manager. And so 
I think if obviously if um if you're running kind of like a incubation group or um something like that, you're gonna listen to Sarah's episode from uh Vault, right? Um if you're um looking for GPs or individuals, you're gonna listen to Boris episode, right? So, or, 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 or J Cal's episode. So like there are different flavors for everybody. I think this is really putting the work on you of like, who do you think you're as much as we push our founders to understand who is their ideal customer yeah. profile, who's your ideal LP profile? Like that's what you should be thinking about and testing. One All final right. segment. Yeah, one final segment. So we did this last time and I didn't hear anybody say absolutely no again. So we're going to continue to do it. And next time Alexa has to do one. Um, but um, it's additional information. So we know DDQs are um, the diligence questions are questionnaires are really long. Um, and then they ask at the end, do you have anything additional? It's like, no, I've signed off my child. And you know everything from my social security to who my kindergarten teacher was. Uh, but we wanted to do some additional um, information where it's just a parting thought uh, for you all. So we'll take suggestions, feedback, and we'll make sure Alexa does it next time. I finished listening to Power Law about two weeks ago and I was enthralled uh and hooked as i got a glimpse of the history of venture capital in the united states and globally i noticed a few things uh venture capital is a young person's game unless you can stay hungry and nimble uh like some type of vc lebron uh which it felt like in the book was mike and doug at sequoia uh i also noticed that the industry is constantly evolving uh the author pointed out Every new successful fund from the 70s on had two things in common. Uh, one, uh, they had a recognizable investor or a group of investors that has some type of cloud or community uh, that saw value in their uh, previous experience. And two, every new firm that entered the market had a truly novel approach to the venture capital model. Uh, this book left me with a lingering thought I couldn't shake. The lingering thought was, what is going to be that next novel approach that provides a new firm with a lead, which then causes the entire market or a good portion of it to join in and becomes table stakes? Mm. It happened with generalist approach in the 70s. Uh, then it went on to prepared mind from the Excel being a telecom fund. And it's kind of led to the whole wave of verticalized firms. Then there were services and platforms that, you know, Andreessen and other large firms uh, uh, brought into the market. And then we had early data firms, right? And now it's growing into the next thing will be these truly AI automated firms. Um, but what will be next? Um, I'm seriously thinking about what will be next. Um, so I'll take a wild guess right now. Um, uh, maybe it's not just about AI platforms, but how we use them. Imagine a venture firm that leverages AI, not just for the analytics and automation, but for fostering deeper human connection between investor and founder and founder and customer. A platform where AI curates personalized experiences for the founders and investors making network feel like serendipity. Or what if the next big thing is the democratization, democratization of venture capital where blockchain, bet you didn't think you were gonna hear that word today, um, creates a more transparent uh, and decentralized fund that allows anyone to invest small amounts in startups, disrupting the traditional LPGP model and ending our podcast. Or is it something even crazier, like venture firms becoming mini nations and with their own digital currencies, governance models, social contracts with their portfolio companies? Who the heck knows? The point is, the next big thing is probably something we can't even fully imagine yet. 
And what makes this industry so damn exciting is that fact. So what's next in venture capital? Your guess is as good as mine, or maybe it's not because I have a really weird guess that I think someone should build, but whatever it is, it has to be bold to actually shape the future of this critical industry. See you later, Allocator. After portfolio tile, investing with a smile. <laughs>